Hi, I'm Tyson Franklin, and welcome to this week's episode of the Podiatry Legends podcast. A podcast designed to help you feel, see, and think differently about the podiatry profession. With me today is a podiatrist from Singapore. I have Lewis Nerney with me. Lewis, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thanks, Tyson. Thank you very much for having me on. It's taken a little while to uh, get you on here because you have been busy. You've had a few changes with your career as well, which we're going to get into. Sure. And initially, you studied in uh, England. Yeah, that's right. I was at the University of Huddersfield. So I'm from Yorkshire originally, as you can probably tell. I've got a, a terrible accent. Um, well, I but... thought I'd point that out. That's why I thought I'd, I'd point that out early, yeah. that you're from the UK, because people are going, OK, if they're watching the video, they've figured out you're not from Singapore. <laughs> That's I think so, if, they, yeah. if they hear the accent, they're going to go, geez, these people in Singapore, God, they sound like the British, don't they? <laughs> yeah, that's it. You'll have to get the answers on all our videos, so it's fine. Don't worry. <laughs> you just... <laughs> no, I only do that when I have to get, when I get have Irish podiatrists on, you yeah, subtitles. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just nod and, yeah, nod. <laughs> I, I remember one of, one of our lecturers was uh, the head of the podiatry department, Alan Crawford, was Scottish. Yeah. I remember having a Scottish patient coming oh, in yeah. and he was like, hutton, hutton, hutton. And I'm going, I have no idea what he's saying. So let's go and get Alan. Alan will do, be <laughs> our interpreter. He comes in and the guy's going, hutton, hutton, hutton. and Alan's just walked in and go, no idea. He's from <laughs> yeah. the Highlands, not, the Highlands Scottish, somewhere. He's just drunk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so I studied in the University of Huddersfield. So that's yeah, West Yorkshire, just between Sheffield, Leeds, Manchester, in that kind of triangle. So the north, you would consider. So yeah, that was back. I graduated in 2018, it was. And yeah, so really enjoyed my time studying. And I was a little bit lost in terms of direction of where to go next after into my final year, re realizing, all right, I need to kind of put my serious hat on in terms of we needed to look for a job. Yeah. And that was when this whole kind of conversation of potentially looking overseas started. And to, to be honest, Tyson, the, the reality of the situation was while I was a student, I was working part time in a, a big chain of gyms across Yorkshire. So I was in the, like a, a, the head office, like a call center job, basically, and selling kind of gym memberships and customer service stuff. And they used to give us commission for sales in terms of these gym memberships. And I ended up being quite good at that and then working weekends because nobody wanted to do it. And when I had the first job offer from the IT job offer in the NHS, it was significantly less than what I was earning from selling gym memberships. I thought, oh, something's not gone right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where, where did life talk to a wrong turn? <laughs> I, I remember when I actually went through in my day, when I graduated, the first podiatry job I got offered was yeah. $2 an hour less than what I was getting paid at the chook farm to kill chickens. Well, well. <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, uh, after all that time at uni and I have to have insurance yeah. and registration, I'm getting paid two dollars less per hour. Well, yeah, something's, something's wrong. gone not quite right. Yeah, yeah. So that was the kind of the situation. I was like, oh well, what, what am I gonna do about this? So I explored various avenues of what's the best case scenario of, of podiatry in terms of is it in public practice, is it a private setting, is it with podiatry surgery. So my university had a pretty decent program for podiatry surgery master's pathway. Okay. Um, so that was something that I was somewhat interested in and I uh, ended up going down that route for a little while. And at the same time, when I was starting that, I had the opportunity to come to Singapore for an internship. So that, it all started from a conversation at the podiatry conference, I think in Liverpool. The power so of managed conferences to, too. That's it. So I managed to scrape together some of my gym sales money drive over to Liverpool and get a hotel for a night. And then, yeah, just got networking, chit chat and I bumped into a guy from Singapore who, who was telling me about, oh, they've got a private practice over here. And I, to be honest, I'd never even been to Asia and I had no idea where Singapore was. <laughs> I thought, well, it's been beats my placement so far in the NHS. So I thought, well, let's, let's give that a try for a month and see, see what happens. Yeah. So it was initially just a, a month that you went there for a placement just to, as part of your training at the university. Yeah. And okay, so it wasn't, you didn't go there for the job straight up, really a placement, no. something different. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the, the university, university of Huddersfield was quite, that was quite an attractive thing. They mentioned that they did have sort of some connections with overseas placements and being from Barnsley, South Yorkshire, any chance of anywhere else is an improvement. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought, well, no. 
<laughs> what's the worst that could happen so it does, yeah, so it's not that. raining as much you're going <laughs> there's, there's all the wet weather <laughs> yeah people do speak better english actually in singapore than Bansley. <laughs> So yeah, that was a, a one month placement as part of my final year. So my clinical hours in terms of my sort of graduation. And while I was here, it just opened my eyes to a completely different world of and life in general, really. So yeah, without my kind of without my parents' knowledge, I did actually accept a provisional job offer while I was on placement. So it was presuming I pass and get my grades and get my registration. There's a job waiting for you in Singapore. What was the money like in comparison to what you're being offered in the NHS uh, to your first position in Singapore? Not uh, in terms of money, not a massive difference. To be fair, in terms of a, a starting starting salary, it was not necessarily that was the the, the driving point. So it was all a fixed salary and everything, and it was more of a, a little bit of a, an adventure, really, of something different. And what what I was thinking to myself, the dilemma was. Do I stay and do the podiatry surgery master's course or do I try this Singapore thing for, it was a two year contract that was offered originally. Uh, and at the time I was 21, I think. So I was like, well, even if it doesn't work out, I can go for two years, see how podiatry works in this private practice. And then if it's terrible, I'll come back and do have my own practice or I'll carry on with this podiatry surgery gig. Yeah. Yeah, but every podiatrist I know that has gone to Singapore to work has <laughs> absolutely loved it. Yeah. <laughs> it's different. Yeah, it's a very different experience. And I mean, Singapore, for those who have not been, it's, it's a really unique situation because it's tiny. The whole country itself, I think, is 700 kilometers squared. So it's, it, you can drive across both ends in like an hour. Yeah. So it, it's tiny. And there's, I think, six, 6 million people, I think, in terms of population-wise. And I would say one of the main things is it's really developed. And obviously, most global companies, their Asia headquarters will be in Singapore because for tax purposes, a lot lower tax rate. Oh, what's so the tax rate? Got... Since you mentioned taxes, Ooh. that's pricked everybody's uh, ears up. <laughs> that's it. So I mean, it is variable. It is a variable rate. But in terms of comparatively, back home in the UK would be 40% plus. Over here earning slightly more than I would be in the UK, uh, maxes out at around 18% for me, 18, 19%. So it's a significant tax relief. But in terms of corporate tax, I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but it's a lot less, yeah. Okay, yeah, and, but I do home. know, like I've been there a couple of times, and I think if you ever want to yeah. give up drinking, Singapore yeah. is the country <laughs> yeah. to go and spend some time in. Okay, you'll be sober. As soon as you go and buy your first bottle of bourbon and you see how much it took out of your wallet, you will never drink again. So. That's it. Yeah, you'll be broke before you're drunk in Singapore. <laughs> my God, I've never seen alcohol prices like it. But what was really interesting, we were there, I was there with my brother. And I remember oh, yeah. my sister-in-law saying to me, yes, but you notice you don't see anybody walking around the streets at night drunk. The place is That's really it. clean. So there's probably a method in their madness. We did find a vending machine, though, in a hotel that had $5 beers. <laughs> oh, there you go. It there was worth, go. worth the walk. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a very unique place. And I mean, what, what I would say about Singapore in general, you can have a meal for $3 or you can have a meal for $3,000. I mean, there's, 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 they've got everything. Um, but you are right in terms of alcohol, it is heavily taxed. So it is a kind of yeah, once in a while, I would say. It's good. <laughs> but you can find, like what we did find was the local beer, though, was relatively inexpensive. So they're yeah, yeah. encouraging you to drink the local beer if you want to be a drunk. And, yeah. <laughs> and leave all the if you want to drink the overseas stuff we're gonna we're gonna smash you with taxes yeah that's it that's it it's the same thing we're expanding from just alcohol i mean anything singapore doesn't really manufacture anything major so everything's imported so there is a heavy taxes on import stuff so that's it's, it, it our, is an interesting uh, place though because like yeah. singapore zoo is probably one of the best zoos i've ever been to oh yeah 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 that's i've it. never been harassed by so many orangutans <laughs> <laughs> They're just roaming around the place, throwing stuff at you. And but Santosa Island is a yeah. great place. It's it, it is a very anyone who hasn't been to Singapore, yeah. if you've got the chance of going there just for a holiday, you need to go and do it. And then you can reach out to Lewis, and then make your That's trip it. tax deductible. That's you're it. There, That's you're it. there for we're a podiatry right. meeting. CPD sessions. We're always looking out for. Uh... <laughs> hey, that's not a bad idea. We should do something in Singapore. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. There's a good setup in, in Singapore at the minute. The so the unique situation is that there's no podiatry school in Singapore. So there's no there's a I mean 
as well as globally, there's a shortage of podiatrists, but in Singapore, it's particularly bad because there's no fee to school. So the in terms of like recruitment wise, we're hiring from the UK and Australia as well. So it, we're yeah. all fighting for the same new grads and same staff. So officially registered, I, mean, I think there's 125 podiatrists. And okay. around it's more than I thought. Around it's only about a third of those are in private practice. Yeah. So the majority are in kind of hospital setting and in that public sector. Yeah. Oh, okay. We could do a two-day podiatry business reboot in Singapore. That's two-day it. live yeah, event. Be good. That would be fun. Give me an excuse to go back up there. That's it. Yeah, we'll have a, uh, a nice cold beer waiting for you. Just yeah, one. and from Cairns, <laughs> we get a direct flight. I think it's only six hours. Oh, perfect. Yeah, it should be. Yeah, it's about, I think, eight, eight hours to Melbourne. So probably, yeah, probably six. Yeah, six hours to Cairns. So hmm, I have no excuse not to do that. Oh. There you go. I'll see you soon. <laughs> <laughs> so you took a position there. You've been there since 2018. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So I was initially so the the, the internship that I had was in a kind of a, a group practice in Singapore, uh, and then I guess I yeah graduated in June, July, got my registration across by end of August, and then started in September. So straight in at the deep end, but the, the the practice at the time had around I think about fifteen podiatrists, so quite a, a decent size. Group. Oh yeah, yeah, four four clinic locations, um, and I was just as I said fresh off the boat, and the objective was just to be a sponge, really, and just learn whatever I can from anyone, while having this sort of new experience in Singapore. So it is a so it was a, a private practice, and it's a little bit different in Singapore in terms of insurance. So podiatry is not really claimable in terms of insurance as it is in ours and, and I think parts of the UK as well, you can start to do that. So it is a little bit of a unique situation, but it was an excellent place to learn. I really enjoyed that. I learned a lot and kind of got thrown in at the deep end really. So it's kind of like I've heard you say before, I'm, I'm good friends with uh, Cameron Bennett and a couple of the guys. Yeah. And it, it was a case of kind of, yeah, learning on someone else's dollar really, which is great to kind of build up the reps, build up the mileage. So were you doing all aspects of podiatry like as soon as you, in your first job? Was it mainly sports or was it a broad aspect of podiatry? Uh, pretty broad, to be fair. We'd see all aspects of podiatry, a bit of routine care, a lot of musculoskeletal stuff. We did see a couple of pediatric cases as well. Not too many kind of diabetic wounds, but we did have a few. But mostly the, more, the hospital setting in Singapore is great in terms of diabetic foot care and so this kind of wound management from a podiatry aspect but it's just those kind of musculoskeletal cases it's difficult to get in appointments and whatnot with, with public sector so um, you were saying a third are in private practice two-thirds are employed by the government i take yes. it in, in hospitals in yeah. the hospitals are they still doing all aspects of podiatry as well i believe there's an element of all aspects but i think it's predominantly diabetic foot care high risk wound care some orthotics as well, but I think as far as I'm aware, don't quote me, but I think predominantly it's a case of wound care and, and high risk foot care from what I've heard from my colleagues and, and stuff. Okay. So when you went straight into private practice and the group you were with, you stayed with that same group the whole time? Yeah, that was it. So I stuck with the same group up until kind of late last year. So yeah, I had two years, two years of employment at the initial sort of start was like a quite heavily mentored. So obviously I was coming from a fresh grad, not really any experience or exposure. So quite heavily mentored, shout out to the senior guys and it was a rotation around, around the clinics and different podiatrists uh, and just with an emphasis on learning as much as I can. Mm. And then it was progressed onto my kind of own independent practice once I build up sort of confidence and a bit more kind of clinical maturity into uh, the, by the end of it, I was the deputy head of the department for the podiatry team. So it was a kind of bringing in new grads and then mentoring and training and whatnot and building up into that independent practice. So yeah, it was quite a good ride, but yeah, a lot of learning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious because you said most of your new grads came from the UK and from Australia. Yeah. So you being at this clinic for six years, you would have seen a number of new grads come through. How, yeah. would, how would you compare the two? <laughs> yeah. Good, good question. Actually, there is, I would say there is a dis distinct difference. I would say. To, to summarize, I would say Aussie pods typically have a lot more mileage in terms of MSK, a bit more kind of sports focused, a bit more private practice focused. Whereas a lot of the, the system predominantly in the UK is very much geared to 
once you've graduated podiatry, you could start an NHS job the next day. You could do that and be up to speed, roughly, in terms of wound management and, and diabetic foot care and vascular assessment and screenings and all that kind of stuff. Whereas I would say the typical Aussie pod has normally had a little bit more experience with orthotic design, a bit more confident in musculoskeletal assessments, potentially, just broadly generalising. That's just the feedback I've, when I've spoken to people in the past, I'm, I'm doing a, an episode with Jim McDonald in the not too distant future. And we're okay. talking about yeah. podiatry around the world. Just okay. what, what, yeah. from what we've experienced and what we've seen, talking with yeah. different podiatrists, and we're probably going to touch on this as well. And for what I've seen, it has been that way where people in the UK have said to me, when they do their training, you're almost trained to go and work in the NHS for a while. Yeah. National health system for people in the United States yeah. who don't know <laughs> what we're talking about. And to work in private practice is ooh, a bit of the unknown and a little bit scary, whereas yeah. Australian podiatrists seem to be, you know, you graduate to go and work in private practice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would completely agree. I mean, my, my kind of minimal experience of that exact scenario, I would agree fully, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's good. I'm glad I asked that question because I was wondering, you would know <laughs> firsthand because you'd be constantly getting them coming in. Yeah. What, what's the turnover of staff though? You were there for two years and you've stayed on. Do most people yeah, so, stay two years and leave or do they stay longer than the initial two years? It depends. And I would say there's a, a little bit of a stark difference. And, and what I would say is, I could just go back to your, your episode that you did recently about your Mexi Mexican fisherman and the banker. I listened to that on my way in this morning. Excellent, excellent analogy and great, great story. I would say Singapore is a very kind of fast-paced environment. And in terms of developing your mileage and earning potential as well and career development is very good for that but you can potentially miss out on some of that in terms of not necessarily work-life balance but in terms of having the ability to travel and you can get that done and it's not and you can travel a little bit but in terms of building like housing prices that are really crazy expensive in terms of for foreigners so it's not really some place that you can settle down initially i would say yeah it's very go 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 it's all full speed ahead I would say the intensity level is quite high in terms of career progression and kind of earnings wise. That's great. I mean, the, you can definitely earn pretty high here in Singapore with that sort of tax rate and everything else. But I would say, so if, if you're in that stage of your career, potentially, uh, or if that's the objective and that's like, that kind of suits your kind of personality, it's really great for that. But for example, I've got a couple of colleagues who I think they did three years and they moved on to New Zealand for a little bit more of that slightly more relaxed Kind of work-life balance in that new job yeah and that suited what they were looking for better yeah it makes sense though because i can understand like singapore is isn't it the gateway to asia something like that yeah they market yeah. it that way and we because we know from cairns if we want to go to thailand we have to go singapore yeah. to thailand where we can go directly to bali but there's a lot of other countries yeah it's all via singapore yeah, that's it. That's it. So, for example, your so Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, everywhere from there is within like a two and a half hour flight from Singapore. Yeah. Um, so you can have another couple of nice long weekends and stuff. So that's that's good. <laughs> so to go and buy a house there is expensive or an apartment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so initially, a new grade getting there, they can make good money. They can do a lot of good travel. But it'll yeah. take a little while before they've got the cash behind them if they really want to settle yeah. down. Potentially, yeah. And I think it's just how, how Singapore is viewed. It's, yeah, accommodation is really expensive in terms of rental and if you were ever to look at purchasing property. Cars are really expensive, so they're heavily taxed as well. Yeah. So it's, it's crazy, yeah. So Singapore, I would say, is probably the most efficient place I've ever been in and terms they, of public transport. Everything. And they, they don't yeah. have Ubers there either, do they? There's no Ubers in Singapore? They do. So it's, they call it Grab now. So Grab and okay. Uber merge. So it's branded as Grab. But yeah, so it's basically the issue is there's no space. So you can't have too many cars or it's going to be traffic jam everywhere. So they, they heavily tax the cars and then public transport is amazing and very cheap. Yeah, I remember yeah. seeing, I think we, the last time we were there, Uber wasn't there, but we got a taxi. Okay. It was yeah, okay. so cheap. Just went, why would you <laughs> yeah. bother? And the taxi driver was really was actually friendly and nice to us. So we're thinking, why yeah. would you need an Uber? And then I think there was yeah, like yeah. an average car that we may have paid thirty thousand for in Australia. It was like seventy oh, thousand yeah. dollars. Oh, we probably more. Yeah. We went, yeah. Okay, I mean, that's why you could easily take a taxi. And there were so many taxis around; it was really good. Yeah, 
That's it. That's it. So it's inner city lifestyle because you can't drive for two hours. You run out of land. You know what I mean? You run out of Singapore. I <laughs> 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 want to do a lap. <laughs> it also sounds like a really good place. Someone who's maybe worked for a few years has got a bit of money behind them. They've had, a, say, a bit of a career. They maybe even had their own business. Yeah, yeah. 15, 20 years in the career. It sounds like a sort of place where you would go there as well because you would have some money to buy a place. You may not want a car. You want that city living, but still make pretty good money as a podiatrist. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And I think what I would say is Singapore has got a massive kind of expat community. So within a kilometer of where we are, we've got Google head office, LinkedIn head office, Facebook, Netflix, and a lot of these, these kind of head office, a lot of the staff, are lots of expats, Europe, America, Australia, basically everywhere. So that it's massively multicultural and massively kind of a melting pot of all cultures and, and everything really. So it's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we found when we were there. And my wife used to be in the travel industry and she always refers okay. to Singapore as being the least Asian country in Asia. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. Yeah. She said, because it's so <laughs> integrated with so many other countries and cultures, just, it just works. Yeah. That even the accent, they said, it's just different. It's a really unique. Sort yeah. Of place. Yeah. I mean, if you want to test it, most people have been through the airport. If you've been from Oz to UK or anywhere like that, you normally have to stop through Singapore airport. And if you've seen it, I mean, the airport's amazing. We've got waterfalls, cinema, swimming pools and stuff. I think uh, it's not quite Manchester airport where I'm used to. <laughs> they actually have, I think they've got sleeping rooms there too, that if you're, if yeah. you're going to stop over for like six or eight hours, you can go and rent a bed that you can actually go into, <laughs> put your stuff down, go and have a sleep for six hours and then get back up again. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. So, no, it's it's great. It's a very efficient place. And what I would say is it's a very kind of on-demand culture. So nobody wants to wait for anything. So that's it's fantastic to be on the receiving end of that. But obviously, from a podiatry business point of view, to now be delivering that on-demand service, that's a little bit more sort of, yeah, it takes, that's it gears a little bit more of the decisions we've made with this kind of new, new clinic-wise, yeah. Okay, so let's move on to, you say you were there for six years working for somebody else. And yep. now in the second half of 2023, you were approached to set up like a brand new podiatry department with you fit Singapore. What is yeah. you fit Singapore? Run us through all this. <laughs> what, what does this all mean? So basically you fit is a multidisciplinary hub for all things, health and wellness. So initially kind of you fit started off as a bunch of personal training gyms. And that's how it started. And that was back in, I think, 2011. Um, so over time, it grew and they've added physio, added a couple of different services and whatnot. And then I think in the last two years, there's been a big drive for this. They've come up with this thing called the circle of care. So what that means is they want basically all aspects of your health and wellness spend to be under one, one kind of group. So they've got kids' tennis lessons, Muay Thai classes, fitness boot camps, all the way through to physio, osteopath, nutritionist, sports and exercise science, sports medicine doctor, and now podiatry is the latest addition to that. Yeah. Um, so, so this is all under one roof. So you could be working there as a podiatrist and then at the same time people are doing Muay Thai classes. Effectively, yeah. So there's four locations in Singapore. Yeah. We're at the, the, the city centre, so the, the CBD hub, we call it Club Street. So, so right now in the, in the space that we are, we've got, there's personal training, strength and conditioning, nutrition upstairs, physio upstairs, and kind of sports medicine and sports massage as well. So basically what happens is the patients can come in from any kind of spoke of the wheel. Yeah. Uh, so, so they come in through physio or through nutrition or through podiatry or into a sort of through personal training, and then they can access services within that kind of framework. So from a clinical point of view, it was a kind of a no brainer in terms of over my kind of experience of my previous job, what I found is the patients who do the best and have the best results are the ones where they've got often it needs multidisciplinary input in some cases. So they've come to you for heel pain and a bit overweight and whatnot, and we'll take care of the foot and ankle stuff. And maybe they need a diet plan and maybe they've got heel pain because they've started running on, they've been done a 10K I mean, I'm on week one of training and can't move yeah. for a week. <laughs> so it's a case of we were, I mean, myself and my colleague, we were trying to practice in that way beforehand, but it was just a little bit messy in terms of 
I don't know if you've actually been to the physio. I don't know how you're getting on. Is he saying my insoles are shit and that's why you need to, that's why you've got heel pain. And so it's a case of, it was a bit messy and a bit inefficient in terms of, it was very non-Singaporean in terms of getting things done. <laughs> because that's what um, you were talking about before with Singapore, everything is about efficiency. So yeah. UFIT has been set up in a way to try and make the treatment more efficient for the patient. That's it. That's it. Yeah. So we run, because we were, we used to have trouble with kind of like sending patients to physio or sending them to a nutritionist and like, oh, well, I've got to drive over here and I've got this. And so in Singapore, no one's got time for anything. Everyone's in a rush. <laughs> so it's a case of making it as, a, as sort of as seamless as possible and offering as many services as we can under one roof. Okay. And ultimately, the obviously, the aim of that is that the outcome for the patient is the best. Yeah. So they approached you to set up the podiatry department within the four locations that's that's it yeah so it's a bit of a long story so we had a, a working relationship with one of their physios who I, I knew really well a guy called Dave Lee and we used to send patients back and forth just in terms of referrals and whatnot and we used to grab a couple of coffees once in a while and this was back in I think 2020 he said oh you feel having conversations about maybe adding podiatry and expanding the services a little bit and and at the time we did have conversations, but it was I was quite happy in my current my sort of my, my old job at the time. And and if it was not it has not grown into what it is today. So it was mostly gym with yeah. a couple of physios. And then what happened is mid last year, conversations were happening potentially with, with Australia moving across to ours and relocating or, or different practices in Singapore. And it actually was a LinkedIn message. So I thought, we've not spoken for three years, but let me just send a message and see if they want to grab a coffee. <laughs> so, so yeah, we, we sort of just sent a blind kind of LinkedIn message saying, I'm not sure if we're barking up the wrong tree, but we spoke three years ago. Is it worth a conversation or, or not? Let's, let's have a chat. It went from there, really. So they were really keen to add in podiatry. I was in a position where I now have a little bit more mileage and experience and mm. in a position where I can deliver a podiatry team because there's a lot of colleagues and, and, and other podiatrists that were keen to potentially do something together. So yeah, it was yeah, interesting. So, so you moved across there. Did other podiatrists come with you at the same time? Yes. Yeah. So there's two podiatrists, so a couple of admin and nurses as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, not, from, not all from where you are. No, 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 not all from. <laughs> I was going to say, you just rip the guts out of that other podiatry clinic and just drag them all across with you. Yeah, not not exactly. I would say the it was the beauty of it was that you think give us a bit of a blank canvas to yeah. right. We've got a space. You guys know about podiatry. I mean, so I managed to sort of convince you that it was a good idea and we, we were the right people for the job and then had to work out how to actually deliver what I promised. <laughs> okay. So is you fit still just in Singapore or have they expanded it out of Singapore? At this moment in time, just, just in Singapore. Yeah. But very close ties with London and Oz and also Middle East as well and Dubai. Okay. So yeah, potentially expansion in the future, but Singapore for now. Yeah. Okay. Who owns you fit? It's a group, so there's a, it's privately owned, it's not a public company at the minute, but it's a mix of shareholders, I think a New Zealand guy, a couple of British guys, some local Singaporean guys as well, so there's a bit of a mix, yeah. yeah. Okay, so and then with the podiatry side of things, you're purely there as an employee, or are you like a part owner of the podiatry side of things? So it's a, the setup at the minute is an employee basis with a kind of a profit share and a sort of a potential to, to buy into that in the future. But obviously this is kind of a new business within UFIT itself. So it's a case of let's see how we get on. And, and also being a foreigner in Singapore, it is a, because you need a work visa. So you need to be an employee first before you can be a company director. And so it's a little, yeah, the, the logistics of it's a little bit messy, but effectively the UFIT podiatry department is run. We have our own separate PNL that. I'm responsible for and, and then we can go from there basically yeah yeah because i was going to ask you about that about working in singapore itself because you said there's no podiatry school there so every podiatrist has got to be <laughs> imported <Yeah. laughs> what once you're actually imported so I, I assume there's some singaporeans who have gone off studied come back they don't need to get a work visa yeah. but for everybody else is your work visa like two years is it four years do you have to renew it do they boot you out after a certain time if you hang around too long uh well so yes to all of those <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> so so basically how it works is you have a, a sort of a work visa that's in, in partnership with your employer yep. and that will be a kind of a fixed rate and singapore is pretty i would say pretty uh, clever in what they do in terms of trying to support singaporean employment so 
like, like you said, if if I want to hire a Singaporean podiatrist versus a, a British or an Aussie podiatrist, potentially the Aussie or the British podiatrist would require a premium in terms of salary to get that work visa. Yeah. What do you mean by requires a premium? You've got to pay so, more for that um, work so visa? Effectively, the work, work visas are limited and they're quite hard to get. Yeah. So in terms of increasing your chances of a work visa, they need to, so number one, your company needs to have, have a diversity amongst your team. And also in terms of you need to be, uh, they, they set like a, a minimum salary requirement and stuff for, for podiatrists and each individual profession as well uh, for foreigners. So for example, finance industry has got a certain level and that, that goes with age as well. Yeah. Age and level of qualification is all factored in. So They're very organized, aren't so, uh, they? So if you're, yeah. <laughs> what percentage of podiatrists in Singapore are Singaporean? If I was to guess, I would say it's probably around 50%. So okay. how, it, how it actually works is if you're a Singaporean and want to study podiatry, you need to study in Oz or in, or in the UK. Now you can either do that through your own student financing, which is pretty pricey as a, a, an overseas student. Yeah. Or I believe Singapore does offer scholarships for Singaporeans to study in Oz and, and UK. And what they would do is they would then be bonded to a public hospital system for a number of years until that, that scholarship's done. So you do, we do see a, a sort of a, a gentle kind of trickle of podiatrists coming out of public hospital once their kind of bond is over and then venturing out into private practice. Okay, so you've been there six years now. Are you eventually going to yeah. ask for citizenship? Well, it is tough. I've got a Singaporean well, you're going to marry a, like, I was going to say, <laughs> if you get a Singaporean girlfriend and you eventually marry her, it make things easy. Well, it seems like a, yeah, it seems like a tough deal at the minute. So we'll see, we'll see how long I can get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but is there a uh, limit? Do, do they, like if your work visa keeps getting renewed, do they have a limit or an age limit? They say, you're getting too old now, get out and let somebody young come through anything like that no not necessarily it's not as, as straightforward as that it's a kind of basically what's considered is what are you contributing to singapore society that's the main thing so if you're a general menace and drunk every day hanging around bus stops you probably not last very long but if you're uh, <laughs> if you can prove that look I'm, I'm seeing x amount of singaporean patients i'm servicing the production needs of singaporeans we've got uh, other stuff going on as well so if you're adding value to singapore you can stay <laughs> that's the way it works and you said at the beginning when we were talking that there's a lot of recruitment opportunities to work in singapore still that you're still looking for podiatrists yeah, that's it. So basically in, in Singapore, um, as we've mentioned, it's very difficult to recruit uh, and there's not really any kind of feed of, of, of sort of podiatrists locally. So it is a case of looking at uh, Oz and, and uh, New Zealand and UK as well in terms of looking for recruitment. So most podiatry clinics are always hiring at all times in terms of, yeah, most people are open to conversations just because it's that difficult to hire people. But I would say it's definitely, it's not for everyone, but what we would suggest is that for myself and my colleagues here at UFIT, I mean, a lot of podiatrists are in and out of Singapore on holidays and Bali and, and Thailand. Yeah. So we've had a sort of, I mean, we're pretty, we're pretty out there on we've got our social medias and stuff. So we would encourage, if any podiatrists are flying in and out and want to grab a coffee or a beer and, and come and visit, that's what we do. Just have a chat and then have a, have a conversation with us and see what works. Yeah. Just point out to beer, not the spirits, because they're too expensive. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Just one beer. Yeah. <laughs> Just one beer. You're only getting one. Coffee's fine. Coffee's cheap. You're only getting one beer. It's all, to, it's, all it's in Lewis's budget. That's it. That's it. So, yeah, I mean, that's the kind of the, the situation. In terms of internships is something that we would love to add as well. So it's something that we're drawing up at the moment in terms of sort of we're pretty well connected with universities in the UK and Australia as well. So it's something that we, it's not, not finalized just yet, but something that we're working on to offer kind of official placements and internships. Okay. Uh, well, uh, out of curiosity, what's the starting salary for a podiatrist in Singapore off the top? So of you? if we were to hire someone tomorrow as a fresh grad, probably maybe about 7,300 Aussie dollars a month. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that works out <laughs> about 87,600. Okay. Okay. So it would probably be a little bit more than that uh, by the time it's by the time we're done with everything else. So 
Yeah, probably I would say closer to around 90 to 100 in terms of Aussie dollars. But obviously the amount that you keep is a lot higher than what you would in initially with from tax purposes because that tax is variable, right? So yeah. Yeah, yeah, so. But it's also it's the experience. Yeah. I think to myself when I graduated back when you know, Noah was still nailing the ark together and <laughs> like podiatry has changed so much since then and it's yeah. great like i kept up with everything as it was going through and enjoyed my career while i was doing it but i look at the yeah. opportunities that are there for new graduates now where yeah, they yeah. can travel overseas whether it's uk or to places like singapore and other places it's just the world is so small that's it and i mean that's what i always tell people like, people always ask me you know, why do you choose podiatry <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one of the main things is that, I mean, this job sort of allowed me to travel to completely the other side of the world. I've built a new life for myself over here, a new career, friends, family, everything. So it's, yeah, it's been great. And podiatry has allowed me to do that. So without yeah. podiatry, I'd be, I wouldn't be in Singapore. So you wouldn't be on this so, yeah, podcast either. That's it. That's it. So, yeah. <laughs> No, this but is it the is like of my career so far. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez, you've had to have done more than this. But, it's, but that's what I say with new graduates that some of them they grow up in a certain town and they go to university yeah. that's close to their town, and as soon as they graduate, they just want to go back to their town because their boyfriend or girlfriend or family's there. Yeah, and yeah. I'm thinking, the world is a big place. Get out there and experience it, and yeah, then you exactly. can always go back home. And, that's it. That's it. Yeah. And lived your closed in in your little capsule <laughs> lifestyle. <laughs> that's it. That's it. And and, and yeah, I, I mean, mean I, I did that when I graduated. I was too yeah, scared okay. to leave Southeast Queensland. That's where I grew up. Okay. That's where I wanted to stay. And yeah. then one day I jumped in my car and I drove twenty hours north to Cairns. Yeah. yeah. Completely <laughs> different li lifestyle, and I've got no intentions of never heading back. It's where I've been the last thirty something years, and. It's like living in a different country. Perfect. Exactly. And I think that's the main thing. I mean, Singapore, as I said, being so efficient, advanced and technology wise as a country itself, but then in terms of like podiatry aspects for us in our private practice, we, we emphasize a lot of kind of technology and that's what we've found helps drive a lot of our revenue and drives a lot of our kind of new patients coming in is having access to these kind of technologies. So we have diagnostic ultrasound in clinic we've got focused shockwave radio shockwave therapy all this kind of stuff and our latest toys this new 3d printer is the uh, latest thing it's been, it's been great yeah we've been getting there yeah we've been i mean the, the decision was a bit of a long one so basically in singapore as we speak there's no orthotics lab in singapore there is one that's been opened up for the, like, the next couple of months but yeah, there's no no direct orthotics lab. So in my old company and most of the rest of the practices in Singapore, orthotics are all from Australia. And what we've found is, obviously, the busier you get, that cost adds up. And then there's import tax on top of that. And that really stings you a little bit on the cost. And also the timeline as well. So obviously, it can vary between labs, but obviously somewhere between kind of 10 days to two to three weeks, depending on the imports and, and all sorts. So we were having a bit of a headache with that. Yeah, it's way and too long. We were, that's it. I mean, in Singapore, people are already pissed off if the taxi's not here in two minutes. So a month for an insult is not going to fly very long. <laughs> so with this kind of setup, we've obviously, we've invested, we've got those fancy dead bridge treadmills and the, the printer setup. And with that setup that we've got, we can turn around a fully 3D printed custom orthotic in 24 to 48 hours. Yeah. So obviously the production cost is a lot lower. And so we're faster, more efficient. And then we can obviously market that as our event, that's our, our USB, the, the fastest install in Singapore. <laughs> yeah, well, I had my milling machine in Cairns, oh, yeah. and it was great. It took 12 and a half minutes to mill out a pair of orthotics after you did the design. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. we used to say, oh, they're ready for you tomorrow. And, and if you want yeah, them on the same day, you just need to give us some warning and we can make sure yeah, it's yeah. done, which is great when people are traveling like Singapore, they just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they'll be there in 15 minutes. <laughs> It's, so you probably don't need it that urgent, but I, I still think I, I look at the profession as a whole and how long patients still have to wait sometimes to get a pair of orthotics and yeah, yeah. I, I just shake my head going, it shouldn't be that way. It, everyone yeah. should have moved on and should be doing something far and all labs should have come up with ways of getting them out faster and get them back to patients or back to the clinics so they can fit the patient yeah, yeah. within days, not weeks. 
Yeah, that's it. I mean, it's not my area of expertise in terms of the actual manufacturing processes and all that. So I don't want to bash the labs too much, but at least for us in terms of Singapore, everything, every company you speak to is trying to do everything faster and more efficient. So yeah. as per IFIS, why should I not do that? <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I agree. Uh, and the thing is, by you doing it so fast, I will guarantee within the next five years, every private podiatry practice in Singapore oh, sure. is doing it yeah, the same yeah. way. Because all it takes is one person to do it. And once yeah, somebody and does it, and they go, ah, oh, shit, that means we all have to do it now. We all have to actually be more efficient. And I reckon that's exactly the same with all. If there's an orthotic lab listening to this, be the first one to pull your finger out and actually set your lab up in a way that as soon as, whether it's a cast, a skin, whatever it is comes in, employ the people to get it out, buy the extra equipment to get it out really fast, and you will dominate. Yeah, that's a problem that people pay to fix. I mean, we've paid a significant amount of money for a printer to fix that problem. So yeah, there's a lot of opportunity there for sure. So if people want to get in touch with you, they want to come over and have that one beer that's in your budget. (laughs) uh, What's the best way of getting hold of you? So we're we're available on on all platforms. Our our official website is uh, ufit.com.sg. So if you just search you fit Singapore, it'll come up. In terms of myself and my colleague, Elliot, we're on Instagram and, and everywhere as well. So my, mine's Lewis, so L Noni Podiatrist, and my colleagues on there is Podiatrist Elliot Yeldon. So I'll, I'll send you that details across. But yeah, we're easy to find. Uh, yeah, easy but find. I'll put, I'll have all the details in the show notes as well. I thought you might, yeah, I was going to say, look up only one beer at lewisnerny.com. <laughs> yeah. That's it. That's it. It's going to cost me a fortune, so I should have not come on here. <laughs> but I, like you said, you pointed out, like I know so many podiatrists that go to Bali, that go to Thailand, yeah, yeah. have gone to Vietnam. Something. If you're going through Singapore, yeah, just stop yeah. in, stop in, have that beer, check out the yeah. place, and at least then, even if you have no intentions on ever working there yourself, at least have a better understanding of what's happening with podiatry in Singapore. So if you happen to bump into another yeah. podiatrist that's looking for a new opportunity, then yeah, maybe that's the place exactly. to go. That's exactly it. And I mean, my my whole move to Singapore started from a beer in a conference. So, uh, so yeah. Just one beer? Go. Just the one beer. <laughs> <laughs> and that was in England too. My God, I didn't realise they gained I didn't realise they sold them in ones in England. Yeah, just one gallon, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's it. It was a, it was a, it was a gallon glass. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Lewis, I want to thank you for coming on the Podiatry Legends podcast. This yeah. has been fun. We have thank laughed you so much. Yeah. This has been really good. And I think it helps too because I've been to Singapore a few times. So I yeah, yeah. I have a feel for the place. I, I like it too. I, and I'm looking forward to yeah, coming yeah. back one day. And when I come over, we're going to have, I'm going to budget. <laughs> that we'll have more than one beer. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thanks so much Stay for having up. me on, Tyson. And no, thank yeah, you. Yeah, man, look, great, great to chat. And look, if there's something to work out for a business workshop or something in Singapore, let's let's do it. Yeah. Oh, that sounds good to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lewis. So thanks for coming on, and uh, yeah, well, I'm sure we will catch up in the not too distant future. Thanks very much. Okay. Bye.